The title of my talk, at least as I have it in my mind, is as follows. Got it? You ready? I'm going to be talking about the cyber society. Colon. The popularization and personalization of high knowledge technology in the roaring 20th century. Okay? I'll run it through one more time. I start with roaring 20th century. Well, listen, folks. I'm 60, 66 years old. I've been around seven decades. So for me, all this talk about the 60s decade and the 50s and the 80s, come on, that's kitty stuff. I mean, let's back up a little and get the perspective of centuries. You know, then you get to see that these... Uh, these decades are little waves, they're little ripples, and something that the pattern emerges maybe over eight or nine or ten or twelve of these decades, particularly fast-moving decades like the ones we've been through in the roaring 20th century. So from this uh, panoramic viewpoint, I can tell you that um, the 20th century was roaring. It's taken us in seven or eight brief decades from a, a civilization of robot assembly worker uh, Newtonian factory people into what's the beginning of you know the new thing you call the information age, communication age, the golden age of psychology, the age of individual, cyberpunk, cybernaut, millions of names, and we don't even have the right names yet, but we all know that's happening, and um, it's been my pleasure in the last uh, 66 years to have surfed almost every one of these wonderful decade waves. Um, Now, it all began, in my viewpoint, very conveniently around the turn of the century. We always, we know that typically the real changes in human nature, the changes in human politics and economics and society are brought about by two things, by, um, by people who have a, a map or a, a vision or a model of where we're going to go. These are the philosophers. And then the technicians, the people that get together the, uh, the printing presses or the compasses or the, uh, the high technology that can take us where we want to go. At the turn of the century, we had some magnificent philosophic uh, navigators peering into the future. Uh, Einstein. Einstein. Of course, and again, Einstein probably didn't say this, but it's what we think Einstein said. And what a lot of people are afraid Einstein said when he talked about relativity, that in order to understand yourself, you have to understand the other point of view, the other perspective, and that uh, my velocity and location can be determined only in terms of someone else. I mean, that is heavy-duty stuff, and all the monotheisms and the fundamentalist uh, uh, religions, philosophy, couldn't handle that. You know that in 1930, when Einstein came to America, he was considered as, uh, as far out as a, as a crack dealer. Really, the bishops and priests uh, would say relativity. They sensed that, that Einstein had somehow let loose all the solidities and the stabilities. The idea of relativity. They knew, as Jerry Falwell knows today, that cultural relativity or ethical relativity or determining the right and wrongness of the situation depends upon the other situation. Hey, that's something that the boys cannot let happen. So Einstein deserves a great deal of credit for stirring things up. But that was nothing. Max Planck and the uh, quantum physicists said, sorry, Newton, all these uh, theories about a heavy-duty material world of force and momentum and energy and work and all those Bank of London heavy-duty conservative energy concepts, that works in the narrow, narrow range. But listen, uh, Isaac, uh, the basic elements of reality from galaxies to quarks are clusters and probability waves of off-on uh, things called quanta or bits or bytes or yin-yang. In, whoa. in other words, uh, now was that scary? Talk about a bad acid trip. <laughs> the poor Farmer Brown or the poor guy in the, in the turn of the century and his wife, they're trying to get together deal sell a word, and suddenly Einstein says, all relative, and the quantum physicist says, hey, every place you put your fingers, it's, uh, you know, that's unsettling. And then Heisenberg came along and did the most incredible, incredible uh, thing. He said, uh, you never know anything about what's going out there except as you determine it by your uh, technology, by your instruments, and by your thoughts, and by your perception. So, uh, in other words, it's a very, uh, <laughs> Heisenberg taught us to take the universe very personally in both sense of the word. Now, if that's true, that if my reality is determined by my uh, technology, 
it's a drop of blood, and I, you, I eyeball it, and you look at it through the microscope, and you look at an electron microscope, we've got three different versions of reality. Hey, oh, poor Farmer Brown, he's got a headache. How can he possibly become comfortable and happy and enjoy life in a world made up of changing relative parts of uh, clusters of on off things and where you make up your own mind about it? Hey. Well, the physicists were no help at all. Those guys are running around with the technology and knowledge technology that was Paleolithic. They were on the cave walls, they were using chalk. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Suppose uh, Einstein had uh, Pac Man. Or uh, Niels Bohr had, you know, one of these uh, centipede games where he's moving things around the screen. Anyway, they didn't. So the man and woman in the street, you know, heard these guys uh, make these, uh, you know, formula, made no sense. So who, who's going to prepare a civilization of uh, factory workers and farmers and people that haven't even got the Model T Ford yet? Who's going to prepare them for an Einsteinian relativistic quantum physical uh, ever-changing probabilistic universe. Who? Well, you know who you can count on at every time in human history when we had to make a big philosophic lurch forward. Who, do, who always came to the front, saved the day and showed us and made us feel happy and comfortable with the new future? I'm talking about those friends of ours that have always been around when we needed them. The musicians and the artists and the poets and the writers, and the bards, and the performers, and the storytellers, and the, you know, hey, the minstrels, <laughs> the rock and rollers, right? Uh, the actors, there, uh, the script writers, sure. The whole 20th century, to me, is a story of how artists and writers uh, uh, prepared us to be comfortable in a, um, in a quantum physical world. For example, just the turn of the century, the artists took Newtonian reality, and they totally demolished it. The uh, expressionist, you know, the impressionist, just just panes of light coming out, hitting your eyeball. That's television, really. And then the the, uh, the pointillist, you know, so I was literally painting in in dots of uh, of uh, like your Amiga computer pixels. Uh, the uh, the um, surrealist, the um, the Dada people, uh, uh, for 20, 30, 40 years, all these artists were. Telling Farmer Brown, hey, it's not what you see there, it's not what you touch, but, and uh, gradually then the, then the commercial people took it over. And the advertising people, pretty soon, pretty soon, we're all fairly comfortable living in a Salvador Dali world where watches go over the end and cubism where it's all, yeah, hey, big step forward. We owe a great, great debt to certain um, uh, audio physicists who came up from Mississippi, they were of Afro American descent and taught us how to demolish the old musical standards. I'm talking about the, the black jazz musicians that really blew the old 19th century music. In the 19th century, you know, it was all factory music. You had Beethoven, you had 17 uh, violins, and you had nine cellos over here, and occasionally a soloist could do the prescribed you know, individual stuff. But the jazz musicians got out there and they taught us improvisation and syncopation and uh, innovation. And you never heard the same thing. And not only was I encouraged to innovate and improvise, but you were going to be listening to me and I'd lay off back and then you take over and improvise. So pretty soon, instead of just one of us improvising, there are three, four, five, eight of us improvising. Now we're talking Marshall McLuhan talk when we do that. Then the, uh, oh, the writers. Tell you about James Joyce and most of the poetry of the 20th century. Again, breaking the word line, breaking the grammatical line. Uh, radio was a great help. Radio was fabulous about 1920s and 30s when Farmer Brown and his wife could turn the dial of that little box and suddenly mystical, magical waves come in and they could hear Amos and Andy. That was very comforting. Or Lowell Thomas every, every evening. Or, believe it or not, Farmer Brown could watch the king of he could listen to the king of England uh, renouncing his throne for the woman he loved, or they could hear Hitler Nuremberg <laughs> that really made it live. Or they could they could hear Franklin Delano Roosevelt declaring World War uh, Two, was it? Yeah, I'm, yeah. That was that was not the Sony War, was it? No, that was the Pearl Harbor War. I'm trying to keep it straight here. Uh, all right, then of course screens, the old. Uh, the old uh, black and white films. That was amazing, you know. It was amazing. Once you got going, you wouldn't predict it, but Farmer Brown and Mrs. Brown actually accepted the reality of jittery little figures on a screen. 
Indeed, those realities of Clara Bow and Clark Gable were more real than the people that they lived with. Interesting sign. The culture is getting softened up to, uh, to see things in a, uh, in a screen, uh, quantum, physical, electronic way. Well, uh, uh, World War II brought a sonar, radar, television, television. The baby boomers, by the time they were three or four years old, every day, their little chubby hands turning the boob tube. <laughs> every day, they experience more data, more bits and bytes, more uh, information, more panoramas, more geography, more history, more hype, more bullshit, you name it. Uh, in one day, they experienced more. They took in more data than the greatest Marco Polos in history before. Uh, so we're dealing here with a new culture, a new civilization, a new, new species. I don't know. We're talking about a generation of people who, since the time they were born, have been inundated by data, electronic data. They, to, to the baby boomers and the, and the subsequent generations, Electronic data is the ocean they swim in. It's the mother's milk they sucked in it. It's the stuff they peep in and boot in their little plastic diapers. Data, data, data. They popped it, snorted it, snuffed it. They've been the, talk about a talk about a new generation. Now the baby boomers, of course, were interesting for many reasons. They dominated the last half of the 20th century, and I found it a great pleasure to be in this room yesterday and down at a bar in uh, San Francisco later on yesterday afternoon where I could really uh, talk to Dr. Benjamin Spock. I consider him to be uh, one of the most influential philosophers of all time. Now, he may not agree with that. You know, it's an interesting thing that sometimes people express things they're not aware of it. Maybe, maybe I don't know, I don't realize how important he's such a modest man. Uh, what he did was give us the Bible of the 21st century, the information age. You had to have Dr. Spock telling parents. See, that's the thing. He's not talking to high school kids. He's talking to parents. And that Bible was a common sense book of child and baby care. And he told parents, I was one of them after World War II. We all walked around with this book. He'll deny it. He'll say he didn't say that in any, but I don't care what he actually said, what we thought he said. <laughs> What's much more important, treat your kids as individuals. <gasps> Treat your kids as individuals. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the cliche is demand feeding. You don't feed them when in a, in a factory civilization. There can't be demand feeding. You can't treat people as individuals. You got to line up there and you got to put that screw in every time the hubcap comes along. You can say, hey, Cheech, I'm going to eat. Get back there, Chong. You can't eat. What kind of eat, man? We have to eat at 12 when the bell rings. Well, I'm hungry now. Well, you can't, you got it. Even the bell rings in a factory civilization. But here comes Dr. Spock telling, hey, feed them when they're hungry. <sighs> um, basically, of course, everybody got down the poor doctor. He was blamed for the excesses of the 60s. Ha <laughs> ha. I was glad to have him get blamed. Otherwise, I would have gotten blamed. <laughs> Basically, you know, you could say that he started a consumer society. Now, I know that left-wing people and a lot of New Age people think it's terrible about the materialistic consumer society, but you know, basically it's letting the individual decide what she or he wants and giving them a fair shot at getting it. I'm a, I'm a great, great supporter of the consumer society. And by the way, I think Andy Warhol was an Incredibly important American. How about you know about Andy Warhol, huh? You, I'm not a great admirer of Rolling Stone magazine, but the current issue of Rolling Stone magazine has a wonderful article about, uh, about uh, Andy Warhol. It really lays down some of the stuff that Andy was saying. See, Andy was your first television kid. Andy, was, you know, said, "Gee, gee," he said, "Life is like a television show." Talk about soap operas. <laughs> Come on over to my place. <laughs> and Andy, you know, could never get uh, terribly involved because he was tape recording everything. And the badder it got, the crazier it got around him, the better show he had taped. I mean, that's a powerful, powerful concept of human you know, lubrication, you know. Uh, when you think about it, Andy was suggesting that anybody, you can do it, you can do it. $30 a 
tape recorder and a $40 Polaroid, and you're in Andy Warhol's business. You can record everything that happens to you, and all the, all the people that are giving you a bad time or a good time. You got all the, you know, the concept that you're the director and producer and uh, photographer of your own life film. You know, but Andy would never say that, because all Andy ever said was, great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dr. Spock, uh, you know, in a sense, was, symbolizes the notion, you know, hey, Pepsi generation, uh, Wheaties, breakfast champion, you're the, you're the top, go all the way, you're entitled, you're American, hey, don't settle for anything, go, go out there. That, that's heavy duty stuff to tell the children of a factory civilization that they can go and get the best. But anyway, that's what we thought he said. Now, uh, the... Uh, the whole thing was fine when we were, parents were building um, primary schools and were building high schools and colleges and selling the kids the uh, hula hoops and all that, but uh, the, the psychedelic pudding hit the fan in the 60s when, uh, when the Spock kids hit high school and college and they wanted a gourmet education and they wanted a connoisseur sex and they wanted a connoisseur selective uh, War or not war at Vietnam, and they wanted, you know, they wanted uh, gourmet uh, drugs. I mean, gee, uh, we, we said you, you're the best, but we didn't realize that you guys would take us seriously. You'd actually, <laughs> actually want it. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't think Benjamin Spock understood that. I didn't understand it, uh, and I don't put him down when I say he didn't understand what would happen when, when, uh, when um, children who've been treated as individuals suddenly hit, uh, <laughs> hit, hit, hit uh, adolescence and uh, sexual blossoming and all that. Okay, uh, the, uh, I've been talking to you about um, knowledge technology. Remember I talked about uh, art and I talked about uh, poetry and then I talked about uh, jazz and I talked about uh, movies and then I talked a little about computers and then uh, of course, uh, not about computers but about uh, television. In 1976, though, the, um, a real wave happened, and it was born not in a manger in Bethlehem, but in a garage in Silicon Valley, where St. Stephen I <laughs> and St. Stephen II brought us the personal thought appliance, the home computer. And they called it Apple after the first member of our species, Homo sapiens, the first person to think for herself, of course, Eve in the Garden of Eden, who ate the unauthorized fruit. Uh, I've been involved in computer, uh, the computer adventure, the computer experience. <laughs> uh, I've been involved in software for about four years now, and we're all very disappointed. We're all very disappointed in ourselves and the culture. Why? Because we know these personal computers now the Amigas and the enhanced color and graphics you can put on your screen stuff better than you've seen it on the big movie screen. You can literally be the director or producer of your own films. I mean, there's simply no end to the thought classification and thought processing and changing it. And yet it hasn't happened. Why? Why? Why don't we have... I've, I've got a... My wife, Barbara, is a very intelligent person, a very sophisticated person. And I've got a 13-year-old boy who's very intelligent and sophisticated. Neither one of them would look at a piece of software. Uh, they went through Pac-Man, they went through it five years ago, but they're going to play Pac-Man for the rest of their life. But, um, there is simply not, no software for intelligent, college-educated, book-reading, movie-reading, uh, people who like to be intellectually stimulated. I mean, sure, there are word processing and there's accounting sheets, but I mean, what is there that would really uh, take the place of a great book? Well, when we tear our hair and say, geez, how have we failed, you realize that this whole profession is only 11 years old. See, Wozniak and Jobs did, did, and they didn't invent it, but they put it together and merchandised it in 1976. So we're only an 11 year old kid. Now I believe in re recapitulation. I believe on um, ontogeny repeats phylogeny. I think cosmology repeats biology. I think uh, <laughs> electronics uh, recapitulates uh, everything. We're only 11 years old. See, first we had uh, Palm, that's a little baby stuff. And then we got Pac-Man, that's kind of baby stuff. And then we got, um, what was it, Donkey Kong, we're learning how to walk around. Then we got Donkey Kong Jr., we could swing like a primate, that's getting up there. 
when uh, when Activision Infocom came out with a, a game called The Leather Goddesses of Phobos last year, <laughs> leaving aside the sexist implications or the kinky sex implication, but the very thought that the software public was getting interested in things like boys and girls is it's a good sign in the wind. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe you'll have some. Uh, I'm proud to say that I have uh, done a shakedown cruise of the software industry, and uh, I have located a few intelligent, sophisticated people in software. And one of them is in the audience tonight, Stuart Bond from uh, Electronic Arts. Where's Stuart? Hey, there he is right there. He's uh, produced uh, my product, Mind, Move Mind Mirror, Electronic Arts, and uh, he's one of the rare and special people in the field. Uh, Tim Mott of Electronic Arts and Brenda Laurel of Activision. By the way, I'm working on a, a software program, which I think is very relevant to a discussion about the 60s and the future. It's a, it's a program based upon a book called Neuromancer. How many of you heard of the book Neuromancer of William Gibson? You've got to think about this. William Gibson, Neuromancer. Uh, it has started a new, a new genre of literature called cyberpunk, if you're ready for that. Uh, Neuromancer is a book, it's a science fiction book. It won all three awards, the Hugo, the Nebula, and the prestigious Philip Dick Award. But it's... Um, but it, um, it's not science fiction, it's more science faction. It's the way the world's going to be in 10 years from now, like it or not. You can even see it around the corner if you know where to look. A uh, very interesting world, which I'd like to tell you a little about. And very comforting, because it's a world that's post-political, post-partisan politics, a post, uh, almost probably post-religion. It's, it's an interesting world that Gibson uh, lays out in this book. So uh, we're, uh, we're doing a software program called Neuromancer. Now, uh, key concept here is cyber, cyberpunk. You're going to hear a lot about cyberpunk. I've got an article in Spin Magazine this uh, week about cyberpunk. The word cyber is a wonderful word. It's my key to the roaring 20th century, cyber. Now, I hate the word cybernetics. Cybernetics was developed by Norbert Wiener in 1948, and he said cybernetics is the, is the uh, science of control and feedback of biological uh, human processes or biomechanical, control, control, control. But you look up the word cyber, and the word cyber comes from the Greek word pilot. And Wiener made it governor, or made it steersman, pilot. You think, see, the, the Greeks were sailors, and they were out there sending their little craft around the Mediterranean, and they couldn't get any uh, you know, uh, radioed uh, instructions from headquarters. There was no manual or book or Bible to tell them what to do. They had to weave their way through the islands and they had to check the, uh, they didn't have any navigational stuff, poor maps, and get their way back. They had to think for themselves. T-F-Y-Q-A, you sure had to do that if you were a Greek pilot. And there's no accident, perhaps. And once those pilots got back on land, they developed the great, great moments of human philosophy, where everyone was running around thinking for him or herself. The philosophies in, in, in Athens were thrilling. Everybody thought they had the right to work out their own philosophy. Uh, cyber is very interesting. See, the word steersman comes from the Latin word stare, which means to stand, or it means the stuff you stand on. That leads to status, state, prostitution, constitution, institution. Get it? The Roman word, so the Romans were not out there, individuals piling their boats. The Romans were in galleys, right? The Romans were building aqueducts, building uh, enormous roads in which they're marching all their reliefs. So to them, a steersman is someone who's stirring the legions down that. Very different from the, uh, from the word pilot. So if cyber means pilot, see, that ties into Heisenberg, because Heisenberg is basically saying, everyone, physicists or not, you're, you're kind of crafting, you're navigating your own uh, way through uh, reality. And uh, the, uh, the word cyber suggests that uh, have a model that if enough people become pilots of their lives, we could have what's called a cyber society. Now remember, remember that was the title of my talk, the cyber society. I made you forget, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> we made it. Okay. Thought I was rambling, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the cyber society um, is a society obviously made up of individuals individuals who think for themselves 
linked up with other individuals who think for themselves. So uh, now what does this mean? I'm trying to, uh, in Gibson's world, of course, it's all knowledge. Uh, people don't work in the near future, except in countries where they want to work, because it's insulting and humiliating for any human being to be forced economically to perform a behavior that can, interestingly enough, you know, there's a lot more fun and a lot more challenge, a lot more to do if you're not a worker. Because if you're a worker, you're just doing what you're told. But if you're out there navigating, piloting, charting, uh, figuring out, uh, maneuvering through this new world of information, there's a lot to do. Uh, another thing about uh, the cyber society that uh, Gibson and his friends uh, portray is a tremendous individual choice. There's no more... There's no more complaining about the government or about uh, what happened to persecution. In an age of affordable beauty, you can be as beautiful as you want. Now, we know that a lot of people that become pretty fanatic and angry about life are people that don't think they're good looking. You know, I mean, think about it. You look in the mirror and you don't like what you see there, you're going to be a pain in the ass for the rest of the day if you ask me. <laughs> so, uh, now, I see, this is a heavy concept. Remember, the Catholic Church wants everybody dressed the same. And in, under Maoism, everyone wore the same wonderful psychedelic black <laughs> robe. And it was heavy duty when the well, way you can wear a little color. No shit color. Well, you can raise the skirts a little, or you can change it. I mean, I, mean, I can wear anything I want to wear? Hey, that's pretty revolutionary, isn't it? Well, if you can do that, then maybe I can have my hair the way I want it to. Yeah, maybe I can put on makeup or not. Even men? <gasps> no, not men. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, if I, can, if I can change the way I look and I dress and all that, and then I can uh, cosmetics, then get surgery. <gasps> Facial surgery? Yeah, why not? Then you get into muscle implants. What do you want to play? play for the Lakers? Okay, baby. Well, you want two more feet? Hey, boy, give this, <laughs> give this girl two more feet. And just, yeah. uh, you can literally, there's no excuse anymore. You can literally... Uh, be the person you want to be. Of course, that's the looks is the least important. It's the mind and the ability to maneuver and manage your, your mind. Then the word cyber. Cyber is no longer CY, it's PSY. Get it? Yeah. Because in the future, everyone's got to be a psychologist. You simply got to be a psychologist. You're not a psychologist. You know, you're, no, you're not able to, um, to you know, keep up with what's going on. Really? Oh, yeah. So, oh, no, race, racial problems. Presumably, they'll be diminished in a world where you can be any color you want for as long as you want to. Go for it. Make a statement. <laughs> uh, politics. I was kind of interesting. Um, see, um, nationalism is finished. Um, the people who run the world, um, talking about the Swiss and the Japanese, of course, simply don't want to have Russia and America bombing each other because Japan owns America. <laughs> and no one destroy all that real estate. So uh, nationalism is pretty uh, beyond uh, the pale in the next 20, 30 years. Um, there are no police very much because, uh, you see, in a society where Scarcities are all artificial, we know that. You know, where there's less scarcity, you don't need police that way. The police, the main police, are the brain police, the mind police, the scientific police. Every big, the big, big multinational combines that control most of the world, they want to control. They have their own police forces that kidnap scientists and, you know, or kidnapping techniques and so forth. And there's a tremendous police force to protect uh, your data. So you're not protecting territory anymore. You're protecting the... Uh, the uh, structures and the edifices of data that are, that, uh, that, uh, uh, see, data, cyberspace data is the new continents that we have to explore. You know, anyway, I won't get too far into that. But um, the, uh, the, the people that run things, it's a very pragmatic society, information society, like Andy Warhol. See, Andy Warhol doesn't really care that much about what you do. He's not going to try to order you around. Um, the, the people who run things don't care about drugs or sex or anything like that. See, as long as you, you got to consume, and the, there's an enormous, enormous underground in Gibson's world. I mean, there's enormous jungles where the people are selling hot DNA chips and, and uh, black market uh, brain implants from Tokyo, and uh, uh, and the people who run things like that. Because uh, see, the, most of the most of these um, 
moralities and crusades come from, you know, feudal people that, uh, that can't handle the notion of, uh, of the information society. Well, what else? Uh, oh, theology. There's a tremendously, tremendously fascinating theology in Gibson's stuff uh, about um, the uh, next level. The next level of higher intelligence, or God, or I don't care what you want to call her, um, the, uh, the feudal God is a shepherd God. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. And the Pope of Rome is the big shepherd, and he takes care of his flock. I mean, can you believe that? <laughs> They're still saying that today. <laughs> and in, in the industrial age, of course, uh, God is the, uh, is the Newtonian engineer that runs everything and so forth. But, uh, the higher intelligence in an information age, psychological age, is of course, uh, like pure intelligence. It's a very, it's a very, f it's a very dignified, kind of amusing uh, concept of uh, of higher intelligence that um, that Gibson portrays. Well, now wait a minute. What else can I possibly do in an hour? I've taken you through the wrong 20th century. I've explained physics, art, jazz. I've explained. Uh, what have I left? Politics, religion, sex? What have I left? <laughs>